on the last episode of Who Killed Amy Mihaljevic. Well, the, apparently, we've talked about this, apparently a lot of people are confident. Well, I mean, the, the biggest thing is all three of my top suspects, who I think are the most likely killer, um, yet, you know, in my mind, it has to be one of these three. None of them were actually in the book, you know? The book generated so many new clues and, and, and so much new information that there were there were better stories and better suspects that came out of it. The body of a young female uh, found in Ashton County early Thursday uh, morning has been identified as uh, that of Eamon Mahalovic. Oh yeah, you always you know you always play that game of well you know it could be this guy, it could be that guy. Uh, um, uh, you know everything from the floor refinisher down to whatever else. You always think, oh that makes sense. Amy was in fifth grade at Bay Village Middle School, and as school let out, the faces of students spoke anger and despair. Being kidnapped and she, she's with God now, so it'll be fine. He's sick. We'll just find anything. him and um, arrest him. There's uh, frustration because the uh, murder hasn't been found. There's a lot of anger over that, too. Well, it, uh, it certainly isn't what we were all, and every one of you two, were hoping for. For episode five, we are going to approach things a bit differently. We've laid out the case in great detail, all the way up until the body was found and the hunt for the killer began. But we have not mentioned any particular persons of interest. This is probably because the authorities have not named any particular person of interest, but the fact that I left that out was intentional. I wanted you to be able to put your own perspective on the case and see who you think the perpetrator may be. So this week, I am going to take a deep dive into the suspects that James Renner has zeroed in on because he is the writer that has spent the most time investigating this case and is willing to put his theories out there for the public to discuss. I first met James over a decade ago when he had recently published his book on his search for Amy's killer. Mike Polk, a famous Cleveland comedian, actually helped us get together. I knew someone who knew Mike, and they got me in touch with James because I had always been interested in the Amy Mihaljevic case, and I was actually hoping to do a documentary at the time. I was an associate producer for a Cleveland news station and believed that I could put something together that the station would air for the 20th anniversary. I wasn't able to get that opportunity because I was unceremoniously laid off two weeks before Christmas. That journalism career that I had gone to school for, yeah, it was stopped dead in its tracks. Six months later, my dad would be diagnosed with cancer. Oh, and three months after that, he would be dead. So my Amy project got shelved, along with any real hope of ever being whole again. Fast forward 10 plus years, and a number of unwanted and absolutely miserable jobs, I found the medium of podcasting. I have worked in newspapers as the a and editor for my college paper. I was in radio as an intern at the only news radio station in Cleveland. As I mentioned before, I was an associate producer for the CBS affiliate here in Cleveland. The fact that my next project is this podcast makes complete sense, especially since I believe Amy's story is too complicated to be told in one news segment or even one episode. A long-form narrative on this case is something that can help bring more attention to the case and potentially trigger a memory in a listener that may know something about Amy's disappearance. So join me this week as we take a look at who James Renner believes the most likely people are to have committed this crime. You know, you did a lot of uh, investigating down in Ashland County. And, you know, without getting into suspects too much at this present moment, but like, what was it that you first noticed when you were down in Ashland? And uh, you mentioned one time about the autopsy report having suspects written on the list mm-hmm. and there being suspects down there. Mm-hmm. You, could you expand on that a little bit as far as what the suspects, you know, what the authorities down there thought? Sure. Um, ha- have I told the story about how I got the autopsy report? I think I did. Okay. Um, so... The first thing that struck me when I went down to Ashland County um, when I was researching this this case is that it's pretty much the exact opposite of where Amy was from in Bay Village. You know, she lived in this cul-de-sac neighborhood with lots of neighbors, upper middle class, 
uh, very safe uh, place with, you know, a community um, and, and beautiful buildings and just a nice, safe, clean place. Where they found her body on County Road 1181 in Ashland County, there's, to this day, where her body was found, um, there's no houses directly in sight. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's, I don't think there's even cell phone service down there. Um, it's very desolate. Um, and, you know, the, whoever, whoever dumped her body there was familiar with the area because it was the perfect place to, to, to drop her off. Um, especially if, if, if they did it at night, they would see the headlights coming, um, you know, from a car. If somebody was going to come along, they'd have a good, you know, two minutes to finish up and get out of there without getting seen. So... Um, that's what struck me is, is that whoever did this to Amy was familiar or lived in that area. Um, so yeah, you mentioned the autopsy report, which it took a long time to get from Ashland County. And in that, uh, so as soon as I got it, I got a call from Spetzel and, you know, he, he said, he, he's like, Hey, look, you're going to, you're going to find some things in that autopsy report that we've never made public. And you're going to see some names of a, a couple suspects because we tested, you know, at one time they had a, um, a baseball bat tested for blood and a couple other things. And, and he's like, we don't want that information to get out. The suspects that were attached to, for instance, that baseball bat we're not really interested in anymore. But through the course of our investigation, we did look at that. And there's one other detail that was in that autopsy report that he asked me never to, to make public, um, and and I haven't, um, that that may speak to um, a different crime scene. So, you know, we know that there's crime scene number one, which is at uh, the Shopping Square Plaza where the abduction took place, and then where her body was found in Ashland County is like crime scene number three or four. So in in between there, she was she was kept, um, probably after she was murdered. I I still believe she was murdered within twelve hours of the abduction, but then her body was kept somewhere that was um, sealed away from bugs, but exposed to the temperatures of the outside. So which means like um, a garage or uh, a trunk of a car, maybe. Um, but maybe a, maybe more like a garage or or a cabin, so some place that didn't have heat, but that was kept away from 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 bugs. Um, so we know, you know, at least for a time, her body was kept somewhere that wasn't the uh, the, the the field out in Ashland County. How do we know that? That's the particular clue that I was asked not to gotcha. reveal. But there is evidence that clearly says that her body was kept somewhere else for a little amount of time. You know, it's interesting. <clears throat> when you go over, like, the old, the, uh, the original, like, reports from the plane dealer or, you know, the news reports from that day, you know, they talk about, you know, I know in one of the reports, you know, hunters walked that field. We, we would have seen the body. You mm -hmm. know, we don't believe the body was there, you know, the whole time. We don't, we, you know. Yeah. And they... The authorities have made it kind of, I mean, at least in the, to the media, they've implied that the body was there for, they think, within the almost the whole period. Yeah. At I least think, that's what they imply. Yeah, I think, and I think that's true. I think her body was likely there maybe by the end of the weekend after she was abducted or, you know, uh, you know, within the span of maybe a week, um, and these hunters that say they walk the property and the joggers and things like that, you got to remember that, you know, this is where that curtain and bedspread might come in because we know now because of this recent forensics work that they did that this uh, blanket was uh, covering Amy's body. So it's very likely that that blanket, which um, could 
easily blend into the colors of the field. It would be totally camouflaged there. It might have been covering her body that whole time. And then, you know, a day or two before the jogger came along in February, it was either pulled off or came off um, naturally, or, or and that's how the, the, the blanket ended up further down the road um, and why they didn't see her. One of the reasons I believe her body was likely there most of the time is if you look in the autopsy report, there's there's several pictures, and one of the pictures is this little sapling, uh, like a, uh, some sort of plant or flower, that had grown through um, her her clothes. There was a hole in her clothes, and so you got to allow for for the time that was necessary for that to happen. Um, so that body was there probably uh, most of the time she was missing. Okay, because I was I always wondered just the way that they reported it, like originally, and then yeah. it just became one of those like known facts. Okay, the body was there for the whole time. Yeah, but the idea of it being covered that makes sense, <clears throat> especially if the you know if the weather had turned you know cold shortly thereafter. I know that the day that she was found, it was it was a warmer day. You know, it's, it's kind of bizarre that she was taken on a warm day. Yeah, in a like kind of an Indian summer type of mm-hmm. situation, and then her body was found on a warm February Ab- day, yeah, an abnormally warm, an yep. abnormally warm day, and it, it goes to what you just said about the blanket or the curtain using yeah it for camouflage, <clears throat> and then saying that okay, well, if it is a warm day in that part of the area, especially since we've both been in that spot before, the wind down there will. Yeah. Blow anything. Yep. Anywhere. It'll cut across that, that field. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, if it had been covered and it started to defrost, and let's, you know, and let's say it's, it may, and that's why they didn't smell it, you know, the decomposition, you know, because they talk about, well, the decomposition that we would have smelled it if we, because we walked the road. But if it's winter yeah. and it's frozen, you're not going to smell anything decomposing because it's not going to be decomposing because it's frozen. Right. Right, right, right. So, I mean, I guess it kind of throws that. Plus, you know, the location of her body is far enough away from any houses. You know, the only person that's going to get close enough to encounter that body or, or, you know, smell anything that's happening with that body um, is, you know, this, you know, somebody like this woman who's jogging or walking down the road. Yeah, but you and I have both been there. It's not like it's. It's not like the guy rolled up on the side of the road and just pushed her body out of the car. He actually had to have picked her up and carried her into the field. Maybe not. Um, there's a where her body was found. There was there's this little part where on either side of the road where you can kind of pull a car into and out of that field. So it's possible this person could have driven into the field at that point and then kind of hold it but you know i i don't know and i don't know how 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 much that gets her close gets us closer to figuring out exactly who or or how um but but to answer the, the the main question she was likely there most of the time another thing that comes up in regards to those first initial reports is they talk about we saw a car the night before or then one of the nights during the week before sure. with a trunk open on County Road 1181 oh, yeah. and you know even you know to the point where you know Bob Hawk is talking about how we're investigating it and yeah Lu- you know Lieutenant Wilson wouldn't comment on it but they were investigating was that just red herring I think it is uh, <laughs> I think it is I, I don't put much stock in that sighting at all for a couple reasons the person you know the person that saw that supposedly saw it uh gave um you know uh sat down with a sketch artist and the resulting sketch looks nothing like the other um other composite sketches in fact they don't even use that sketch um when talking about the case and and two if if you know thinking about whoever is doing this and getting rid of the body, they picked that place so they could get out of there. You know, again, like I said, they, they could see headlights coming from, you know, and, uh, you know, a minute and a half to two minutes out. There's no way they would have stayed there and waited for somebody to, to pass them with an open, 
uh, an open trunk. They would have got the the hell out of there, you know. Right. I mean, again, like you said, if uh, with where the body was found, they purposely kind of gave themselves a buffer. Yeah. You know, like okay, I've got plenty of time to get the hell out of here if mm-hmm. I have to. And you're right. That sketch looks nothing like no the sketch. And it's maybe it, it, the uh, whoever saw it uh, saw this person supposedly. You know, said they looked Hispanic. Right, right. You know, and but we're talking 1989, Ashland County, Northeast Ohio. There's probably five Hispanic people in the in the area at the time. I don't think I don't think so. And and you know, certainly no Hispanic person could walk in and out of Bay Village without uh, everybody noticing. Yeah, and that's yeah, and that always gets back. You know, goes back to. Obviously, the guy was familiar with Bay Village, but obviously he was familiar with Ashland County, and it's obviously what the authorities, and as well as you believe. And so, what's the connection? I mean, is it the fact that he lived down there, or is it the, you know, I mean, we've talked about, I mean, we can talk about your top three suspects right now if you want to just run down the list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so my you know the the person that's always or at least since 19, uh, 2008 the person who's been at the top of my list uh happened to live a mile away from where her body was found, you know? And and he was also an avid he had to he had to walk or run every day. Um and his route, you know, walk, he would have walked I know he walked or jogged past that body when it was there. Um, so, did he place it there so he could see it? I, I, you know, but I again, I'm not a hundred percent on any one suspect. But yes, my to- my top suspect lived a mile away from there. Um, the the second suspect, uh, this um, Metro Parks uh, director, um, has the least, you know, direct. Uh, connection to that area but you know he's um you know he's he's in he's in uh, into nature he would have been familiar with at least the parks down there but again least least connection the the third suspect this uh math teacher who is connected to the girls from north olmstead who like amy got calls from from this man um you know, he was his sister was involved in horseback riding, and there are several there are several places down there where she would have been familiar with, uh, where he could have visited her. So that there's a connection there with with horse stables, but not as direct as as simply the first suspect happening happening to live, you know, a mile away from. So you got this guy. You know, he he lives a mile away from where her body was found. Uh, he's been reported for inappropriate behavior at the school he teaches. Um, he looks like the composite sketch. Uh, he's volunteering at the nature center. There's a lot that's stacking up against this one man. And this one man would have had access to the girls' phone numbers in North Olmsted through, uh, I believe, through the logbook that was at the nature center. Okay. Yeah. Now as f- now, speaking of the teacher from North Olmstead and the connection between, okay, so there are a few connections there that also are kind of are red flags in the sense that, okay, yes, his sister was Amy's riding instructor. Mm-hmm. And the girls so, from North Olmstead were in his math class. The girls from North Olmstead were in his math class. Potentially knew the area because of the horse connection. Mm-hmm. What was taken from Amy when they found her body? Yeah, the the horse head earrings. And the riding boots. And the riding boots, right. Right. As well as the binder, but the two of the three things have something to do with horseback riding. Right. So is that, an, an, you know, does that avenue present something new, or is that, like, just trophy hunting? Yeah, Um that's a good question. Um, I don't know. And and along those lines, did she have the binder by itself, or or we is she missing a backpack too? And that's the question that I was going to ask next. Is really? because why 
have they never mentioned the fact that her backpack was because they say that she went to school with her backpack. Yeah. Well, she had to have left with her backpack, right? You would think. I mean, I don't think fifth graders have. I mean, they don't carry binders by themselves. They're fifth graders. Right. This isn't, you know, college where you just right. carry it. And it's it. not like she left it in her car seat. She's riding a bike. So and are then we she's missing. walking over to the plaza. So are we missing more than the uh, those three items? Because the backpack is never reported as being found. Or at least I've never seen yeah. it being reported as being found. I've seen it reported as being uh, what she left school with. That's a good question to put to Spetzel, just to see what he says. You know? Yeah, because I honestly, I've no, I honestly don't know the answer to that. Um, so, you know, what could have happened? Um, you know, let's say she had a backpack or you know this binder or whatever. Um, it makes more sense to me that the binder was in the in a backpack. So she gets in this guy's car. They're driving to, uh, you know, the 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 mall. Uh, you know, which. Abstens- you know, is, is probably just his house. Um, but he's got her in the car saying they're going to a mall to get a present for her mother. She puts her backpack down. Um, and then, you know, I think she figured out fairly quickly that she was in trouble and tried to maybe get out of the car or fight against this person. And I think that's when she was hit on the head because um, she suffered blunt force trauma to the head, and I think maybe that knocked her out or at least you know, got her to the point where she's not really fighting back. Um, at, and you know, I think everything escalated pretty quickly from there. So you know, I don't know that you know, wherever he took her you know, is a crime scene, and I can't— there are a couple things on that. One, p- murderers don't generally drive— too far with a body in their car because they can't risk getting pulled over for a, 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 a taillight or something stupid like that. So wherever she was murdered is not far from that field. Um, two, you're not going to want to hang on to something like a backpack. Um, so it's just another thing that could tie him to the crime. So I imagine something like, you know, either burying or burning that stuff. Um, and the the earrings, um, you know, those I could see as like a, a trophy or something. Yeah, I definitely would think that the earrings, I mean, it's just so easy to kind of keep in your pocket or if you're that kind of yeah, sicko. Nobody's going to, you know, nobody that, you know, is in your wider life, I guess, is going to necessarily look at a pair of earrings that you have and and think oh my god you're a murderer you know so i could see him saving that as a you know somewhat safe trophy yeah it's you know again the connection between ashland and bay and that you know the number one suspect the one of my questions that i have in regards to his connection is if he if he's the guy, he would have been, you know, and he did volunteer at the Nature Center. He would have been recognized potentially. In Bay? In Bay, right? I mean, I'm just saying, like, just p- playing devil's advocate. I mean, yeah. if this guy is never planning on coming back to Bay, which he could totally, you know, plan From on. what I can tell, he never went back to the Nature Center after that. <coughs> so... Circumstantially, that is absolutely suspicious. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So you know, maybe he, you know, he. But again, you know, look at it from the other side. If he was in Bay that day, maybe he did get recognized, and you know, whoever saw him there wouldn't think twice of him being in the area. Now, the the people that saw him approach Amy, you know, look at what happened to the composite sketch. It looks like you know this is a guy that looks like. A guy. This is a guy that looks like your typical, you know, Northeast Ohio dude, you know, and and that's why so many people have been looked at is because there are so many people around here that look like the composite sketch. He looks, he literally looks like everybody's freaking dad. Yeah. Or like, or uncle or something. Uncle, soccer coach. Um, you know, 
I asked Mr. Mahalovic, I'm like, did, he, did she play soccer? Because, mm-hmm. you know, just that whole soccer connection, too, you know, just because yeah. North Olmsted's a big soccer, you know, community. Now, did this teacher have anything to do with coaching? No. no. As far as okay. I know, no, he's definitely not an athletic, um, at least not in that sense. He's, you know, an avid walker, jogger, but no, not a coach for soccer. He, But there is um, another suspect that I would say— you know, in my top 10, if we expand this a little bit, there is, there was a coach that uh, coached soccer at North Olmsted who has uh, really been looked at. Um, and he, he was a dentist in the area at the time, and he may have been Amy's mother's dentist. And he was coaching soccer at the time where these North Olmsted girls were also playing soccer. And they would often play in Bay Village, and what we know about this guy for a fact is that he was writing love letters to one of these 11-year-old girls on his soccer team at the time. So guy's definitely a creep. He, he would take these girls on overnight trips into Canada and rent one hotel room because he had a daughter the same age. So it would be him alone in a hotel room with four or five of these girls. And at least I think two or three of these girls have come forward to me uh, talking about very inappropriate things that, that he's done. Have you spoken with him? I think I did briefly. Yeah, I tracked him down to, this would have been back in like 2008, 2009. Um, I tracked him down to Las Vegas. I think he's still in that area. Um, but uh, yeah, very strange very strange individual, so definitely connected to the to the soccer stuff. Yeah, the you know just it's one of those bays like famous for it's just like their soccer and yeah their running, which is ironic just with the whole hmm. connection between um you know your top guy and yeah and you know just his avid walking and running addiction. Um, now as far as the So you think, in regards to the body being found by in Ashland, you think she was actually killed near where her body was found? You don't think her, her body was transported there? You think it was more like oh, he no, took I, her down there? I think I think her her body definitely had to have been transported from there, but I don't think very far. Okay, I think wherever her body was being kept, you know, garage or cabin or you know, even possibly a trunk of a car. Um, Again, you're not going to drive far with a body in your car. You can't risk it. So um, whoever whoever killed her um, did it at a location that is very near where they found her body. I'm, I'm, that's one thing I'm convinced of. And it, it make, <clears throat> kind of makes you wonder if he – I mean, did he keep her in, her tru- in the trunk? <laughs> did he – It's possible – you know, she was found, you know, one of the big clues in this case is are these trilobal polyester fibers that were found on her body. And they match. They're like nutmeg in color. I think nutmeg was the the, the design color of, of these, these fibers. And they're a very particular kind of fiber that was only manufactured by um, a type of... If, I believe um what what type of car is a Grand Am, a Grand Prix? Pontiac. Pontiac. Yeah. So these 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 fibers were only manufactured for that type of car. It was a Pontiac um gold uh you know tan um colored car that she was in during the abduction. Um and we know this from these fibers. Now, my top suspect Drove a Pontiac car that was that exact color uh, at the time of the abduction. Now, that was a big clue. Now, with this case, I've said this before, everything that could go wrong went wrong. We were able to find the VIN number for this suspect's car in an attempt to track the car itself down to see if maybe there'd be any evidence after all these years. He had sold it 
and it transferred to a couple different people and then ended up in a um, uh, junkyard in West Virginia. Now, my father-in-law is an auto body uh, mechanic. Well, he owns an auto body shop. And, you know, he, he heard I was going to go looking for this car. He's like, he's like, you don't want to go down there alone. This is a different part of the world that, that, that you don't really understand. I'm like, what? Uh, whatever. Okay. So um, he, and he'd never offered to do this before. It's, five, it's four hours south. How I could know, it be right? That, how could it be that bad? Well, we went into the hills of West Virginia, and it is like, we're talking clapboard shacks and people living off the grid you're in the the mountains, and that's where this junkyard was located. Moonshine territory. And um, we found a car that was the same make and model. Um, and here's the bummer. Um, here's you know the car that ended up in that junkyard was likely crushed um, and and recycled before we got there. So um, we didn't find the exact car, but we found something similar. And we started looking at the VIN number because um, I want to get this right, uh, and it's either one or the other, because these fibers that were on Amy's body were tra- tracked to a Pontiac, I believe, Grand Prix. And the VIN number for the, the top suspect comes back to a Pontiac Grand Am. Could be vice versa, but I think I got it right. Um, so it's like, it's the same colors. Everything everything matches, but the VIN number says that it's not a Grand Prix, but a Grand Am. Now, what I found out, I'm 100% convinced about this. Every once in a while, the VIN number's wrong. You know, it the, there's a mistake. You talk to my father-in-law who runs this auto body shop, and he's like, yeah, this happens more than more than you would know, where you enter in the VIN number... And you know what kind of car you're working on because it's right there in the shop. You enter the VIN number and it says, no, 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 this should be something else because it's a mistake. And I think this VIN number that is associated with the suspect's car is a mistake. And I don't think he was driving a Grand Am. I think it was a Grand Prix. I even went so far as to track down the student that he hired to detail his car at the time. And I talked to a number of students that were in that car, by the way, because he used to pick up kids and take them and uh, over to Wendy's for, for dinner a lot. And, Isn't that ironic yeah. that he ends up working at Wendy's? Yeah. Um, so um, I talked to the kid that detailed his car, and I said, the VIN number says it was a Grand Am. He's like, what? No, I've been in that car. I've cleaned it from top to bottom. It was a Grand Prix. If, if if it's saying it's a Grand Am, then it's wrong. So Yeah, because Grand Am's, I mean, honestly, you would know the difference. A Grand Am's a smaller car. A Grand Prix is the bigger version yeah, yeah, yeah. of the Grand Am. I mean, it's, but it's not like, you know, I mean, it's like a Civic and an Accord. Yeah. You know the difference. Yeah. Well, if you're a car guy, you know the difference. Well, and, I mean, if you're a kid, you know the difference. Yeah. You know Especially the difference if in you're size. De- if you're detailing cars. Yeah. So, you know, that's a that's another thing where, you know, with the suspect, you know, you go to Bay Village and the police and Spatzel and all, all these. One of the things that, you know, they're like, well, maybe it's not him is because the vehicle doesn't quite match. And, you know, you try explaining to a jury or the prosecutor that, the reason it doesn't match is the VIN number's wrong, and they're they're like, yeah, right. Yeah, you know? they're not going to take you seriously whatsoever because but, they want everything ironclad. Right, and that's you know that's the one thing that <clears throat> Spetzel mentioned. He's like, he's like, listen, out of the you know so many suspects, literally only a handful can be ruled out because of the fact that they just don't have his words, ironclad alibis. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, and the and the other thing that you know, is so, like you mentioned before about, like, the creeps, just the amount of creeps that were, one, checking out Amy, but just even living in the area or just the people that we live amongst in general. And it's not just Bay Village. It's, you know, it's a, it's the world. Yeah. Uh, and we can all look up who lives near us with the, you know, the registry list, but it, you know that doesn't do you any good because 
that's just going to cause you yeah. a little bit of stress well, if, if you have kids. But We've convinced ourselves <laughs> that we're some sort of special type of being, but when you look at cases like this and you really delve deeply into it, you know, you're faced with that realization that we were animals, you know, just like everything else on this planet, you know, that can move and think and and do those things. You know, there, there are people that still have these animalistic urges, these predators that live amongst us. Yeah, I mean, our, yeah, we are animals. We are, I mean, if you look, just look at our history, I mean, we have slaughtered people for no reason, mm -hmm. you know. Because they're from a different tribe. If a different tribe or, oh, hey, we think you caused the plague. We're going to, you right. know, perform another, you know, mass killing of, you know, it's just. And we, we you know, there's always that danger of slipping back. You know, we've, we've got this very thin, you know, veneer of, um, you know, uh, grace and intellectualism and and all that good stuff but it's very thin as you can see with what's happening with the country now you know there's always that chance that you can slip back and become this fearful you know predator versus prey society yeah i definitely think you know fear is certainly the um no pun intended i'm not even going to go there but <laughs> uh fear is definitely a driving force in their current state. Yeah. And, and I think it's just, it's awful. I mean, it's, it's reminiscent of when we were kids and they would, the stranger danger. And it's like, everybody's going to attack you and try to kidnap you. And, you know, yeah. you find out later in life that that's like the least likely thing to ever happen. Yeah. Uh, you know, one. We're talking about it because it's so very rare. Right. And, and that says something good, I think. But um, yeah, my my kids are in school now, and they go to these stupid Alice drills where they have these, you know, mock uh, hostage situations to teach the kids um, if somebody's coming in and shooting everybody in the school, uh, you should attack them. You should throw things at them and try to overwhelm them. And you know, I tell my kids. If you hear a gunshot in that school, run the hell out of the school and as fast and far away as you can. Um, you know, and but we're scaring these kids where, you know, this will never, ever, ever happen to them in their life. You know, be, but we're so scared because it happens one or two times a year in in random schools around the country, which is still a problem. But let's not make every kid fearful of something that you know they have a, a more a better chance of getting killed from a lightning strike or an alligator attack you know so or getting hit by a car yeah. on their walk to school i mean i remember being a kid and two girl two little girls or two teenage girls were struck and killed right at the top of my street wow. i mean that was you know you talk about like ugh. Like, yeah that's as tragic and as traumatic as it gets, like, and just, you know, that's the kind of stuff that you should be teaching your kids, not so much how to attack a attacker. Yeah. I mean, that seems Doesn't so counterproductive sense. and uh, putting yourself in harm's way for, yeah. uh, for no, no reason. I'm curious to know, uh, you know, if, you know, several episodes in, has anything changed your mind about the case? My, the, okay, the the way I feel about the case at the moment is that I think a couple, th I have a couple different theories, and Torzny kind of threw me off a little bit on one of them because he mentioned just the thought that maybe this person <clears throat> actually isn't from Amy's background. It's actually from one of the North Olmstead background, mm. you know, maybe that it wasn't a Mahalovic, you know, fam, you know, not family member, but associate or, you know, somebody who knew Mark or Margaret. Right. And that right. was like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, man, I haven't thought about, you know, you get so focused on 
because he used Margaret's work yeah. as the as, you know as the way to get to her. But you know that that alone has kind of just. I mean that if you just if you look at that that part will just totally mess you up because yeah you know you got to figure all those people were looked into I mean I followed it up with you know were those people looked into and they were but it's still it's like how deep does it go because they're not the family the of the victim right you know sure they may have received phone calls but how deep did the investigation go into those people that were calling them potentially and, and now you're trying to track back neighbors. Uh, of of these girls from nearly 30, 30 years 30 ago. 30 years ago, yeah. So, I mean, you really kind of, I mean, you want to talk about a needle in a haystack. You know, so that, that one, that's one thing that throws me off. Uh, but my my initial feelings four episodes in and having talked to all these people, you know, I feel like it's somebody in Mark's background. I just yeah. don't think that, if the killer is brazen enough to set up the kidnapping where he did, he's not dumb enough to use Margaret as the, you know, he wasn't from, my my guess is he wasn't saying like, I'm from Margaret's background, you know, yeah. check me out because why would he, why would he put himself out there? Cause he's got to be right. smart enough to know right. that a 10 year old, yeah, you can tell her to keep a secret, but in all reality, is that 10 year old going to keep the secret? Right. So you got to give her some false information. And placing it on Margaret takes the focus away from Mark. And that's the way I've looked at it. And the reason why I talk about Mark so much is because, or the re- reason why I think it's from his background is because he, had 13 different dealers that he dealt with in his you know in his work amongst those 13 dealers you know you're talking to service department reps you're talking to sure service workers you're talking to dealer owners you're talking to you know um so many different people mm-hmm. so many more people than who margaret's world and circle could have and would have interacted with. Would he have ever taken Amy with him on a on a job? So the thing that about that, they used to have these family. Okay, we talked before about the Christmas parties. Yeah. Okay. The answer to that question about did they did they take the family? No, that was uh, that was like an adult adults only thing. Okay. So what they did have though is they had zone like. I get, you know, I guess it's zone parties or, you know, he was at a zone meeting the day that Amy was abducted, mm-hmm. but those zone meetings took place in Cincinnati because that was where their headquarter hmm. was for whatever his district was. I don't know, okay. but it was in Cincinnati. So they would have these weekend trips or, you know, like Kings Island family day, family picnic day okay so yeah like the, yeah yes like work um work trips or like work parties like cookouts or something yeah no it was like a yeah it was a full-blown like bring your whole family yeah. type of event so that was one yeah, thing that raised a red flag to me because you have kids <clears throat> it's you can't always keep an eye on what is going on at all times and it's if you're at a function with that many people, let's say you're at a King's Island or you're at a, you know, big giant barbecue that's yeah got, you know, Mark's district was 13. How many other dealers right. were involved? I mean, how many people does that incorporate? So it could have been, hey, Amy was off by herself playing, ran into some guy, and he started t- talking to her and, yeah. you know... That that just to me that that opens up so many doors as far as the potential person who could have kidnapped her. Now I don't think the person who kidnapped her. I do believe he was local, you know, because of the fact that they weren't able to trace his number and they right. only traced long distance numbers. Right, right. Does that mean he came in and called from a payphone? Hmm. Potentially, sure, but you know. Most likely, I'm leaning towards that was just if he was from out of. T- I don't think he would have made that. I don't think he would have thought about it. Right. You know. 
thinking about the that's very interesting i'll have to think on that a bit um but you know talking about the phone call itself is um you know my, my hunch is he definitely made this call not from his house you know i i don't know that he would have risked that of course right um so he's using a pay phone somewhere um you know they were pretty they were all over the place back then you don't see any now but um I don't know. What do you think? Is there any other place he could have made the phone call? I mean, <clears throat> he actually could have used the. I mean, there were pay phones at Bay Square. I mean, he could have yeah, easily right called there. her from from there and like standing there looking at where he planned on meeting her. Because why? I mean, one that's not far from where he. It's just well, it's not. I mean, I don't know. It's just not far from. That that would be, like Bay doesn't have a lot of commerce, so there's not a lot of right. places where pay phones would be located. So that would be pretty much, in my opinion, the only place that that and maybe a quarter mile up Dover Center mm-hmm. would be another location where there would be pay phones, maybe by you know the CVS there. But that wasn't even built, I don't think, in 1989. Another thing that that um, uh, that dawned on me is. You know, because I was actually driving through Bay Village uh, last week. Um, I had a I had some sort of meeting up there. Anyways, I, I found myself in Bay Village. I'm driving through, and I, I see the plaza. And it dawned on me for the first time, I bet whoever did this did a dry run. Um, you know, I'm thinking e- either at night, you know, late enough where he doesn't have to worry about being seen, or maybe he did it, you know, wanted to get the conditions right and did it, um, you know, a week before or a day before because he's going to want to know where he's going to park. Mm-hmm. And I think he parked between the auto body shop and that plaza because nobody would have seen him take her to a car. So I think he was thinking through, like, well, if anybody sees me and if anything goes wrong, at least they can't tie me to a car. He had to have at least scoped out the right. scene before he made. And again, okay, you scoped out the scene. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, like you've mentioned in previous episodes where you talk about there wasn't a big giant sign that said police station, but hey, guy who's checking out the scene, did you not look across the street and see the police cars that yeah, are in the parking lot? That is weird, right? Yeah. That is weird. It's completely weird. Like who has the who has The, the cojones. Yeah. I mean, what the... To abduct a girl across the street from a police station, and did, and now, I've been asked this in just in comments. How, how did did this guy know that the police were having that meeting? Right, you know, because I asked Everybody Spetzel about that. it, and he's like, you know, we were having a meeting, and it's like, well, did they know that? I, I would hope not because, I mean, that's a whole other level of, of brazenness. Um, I, I think what you have here is a guy that considers himself far superior and smarter to police, uh, which fits very well with my top suspect. And, you know, just thinks everybody else is so incredibly stupid, he can do what he wants in this world and not suffer the consequences, um, which, again, fits the top. You know, maybe even the, you know, my second suspect, this this gave me chills, um, this this leader of the Metro Parks, who I'm convinced tried to abduct me from a park in old Brooklyn in, like, 1991, uh, which I think I've talked about. Um, you know, he, I went into the Nature Center where we believe this log book with Amy's name and the other girls from North Olmstead would have been, and... I think it was the last anniversary of the case last year, and I was walking through the Nature Center just kind of looking for anything that might call out to me. And big, you know, big brick, you know, square, they have this wall of donors, people that have donated lots of money to the Nature Center. And right there, he's one of the biggest donors to that Nature Center, you know. So it, it, it meant something to him. And then he checks himself into a mental hospital 10 days after her abduction because he can't fight his sexual urges. Um, so there's a lot about that guy, too. And he, you know, again, I go back to this, you know, are we dealing with one person? Or are we dealing with more than one? And 
My top two suspects, I am sh- convinced, knew each other. They had to, I mean, knowing what I know about the top two suspects and knowing the job that the top, I mean, literally, they would have crossed paths, like, yeah. at least either w- once a week. I mean, if let's say a volunteer, I mean, they just, they would have. I mean, either at that nature center or um, I've kind of, I've linked them both to the um, kind of down low homosexual scene at that time. That's exactly where I was going to go with that. And now that's, you know, like in regards to that aspect of it, that is why I would think that he would have known him. Just because of the fact that in 1989, it was still not accepted. I mean, as far, I mean, it was accepted, but it wasn't, it it certainly wasn't what it is today. You know where you would meet back then? The Metro Parks. The Metro Parks, for one, and absolutely the Metro Parks, where, where um, you know, both those top suspects, you know, one guy was running it, the other guy was, and he eventually got arrested for um, doing creepy sex stuff in the Metro Parks. Um, and, uh, yeah, the other one was uh, a science teacher who, you know, often went to those parks for, you know, field trips and, you know, extra credit assignments. But also there, you know, the... Where you would meet men at that time are adult um, bookstores that had the private viewing booths. Now, one thing I know about the guy that ran the Metro Parks, um, because it's in some of these documents that I found, is he um, he frequented this uh, adult bookstore on I think it was Brook Park Road. Had to be Brook. Yeah, right. Had to be Brook Park Road. The only... That was a really seedy place back then. I remember and it's it's come a long way, but yeah, that's definitely where you would go <laughs> for that type of uh, entertainment. And uh, um, you know, and I can definitely see the other guy being there too. Um, so you know, it just goes around and around and around again. And you know that that to some extent that's kind of shielded them from some attention in this case because there are police officers that believe well if they're if they're you know latent homosexuals what are they doing going after this this little girl but the one thing we know about both of them is they were um, attracted to prepubescent children and when you have that um, you know the the people that are into that they don't they don't really differentiate between boys and girls. Yeah, and that's, you know, I actually asked Chief Spetzel about that, if they had, uh, if that was one of those things that they kind of discounted. Yeah. You know, like, okay, he's, you know, more into boys, so we're going to potentially look the other way because of that. And I liked his answer, right? Cause yeah, he was... he was like, no, we looked at every, we looked at everybody. Y- you know, you, you, with all these investigations and with all these, these leads and these you know, the one person that I talked to you, I was texting with you last week, was Rick Burns, mm. the guy who owned the automotive yeah. shop that was where you think the, the perpetrator car. would have parked. Yes. Now, what was it that you said when I asked you about that? Um, Rick Burns has told me that he remembers seeing the car there. Um, in fact, he thought he had had a picture of it, and he was looking through all of his stuff. He could never find this picture. But he described this tan-colored, um, you know, gold-colored uh, uh, Pontiac Grand Prix. And uh, even better is there was another witness that has come forward and said she also remembers the car being parked there between the auto body shop and the plaza because she was. that's usually where she parked— um, to go into this auto body shop, and she couldn't that day because this car was parked there. This is the best witness ever that places the the, the abductor's car there and, and the color and everything. It was a common please judge. Like, you can't get a witness better than that. And and to this day, she swears um, that she saw the, the car that took Amy. That's, um, yeah, that will definitely... You definitely would want a judge to be your eyewitness if you're going to have an eyewitness. Yeah, right. And I mean, I know eyewitness testimony or eyewitness, you know, it is what it is. But, you know, the whole... I, did you hear the part where I asked Spetzel about the fibers? Or have I not? Yeah, I've listened, to, I've listened to all the... Okay, because yeah. Yeah, he mentions, like, it was just one of those fibers that was... 
it was really hard to trace down. Like we discussed the Atlanta child killing mm. case mm-hmm. and how they were able to use that. You know, let me throw out what your opinions are and you know whether or not you think Wayne Williams is the main yeah. or sole perpetrator of all those killings. But with the um you know, with the fact that he was able to they were able to trace his fibers back to his house. Yeah. Because there were only eighty houses in the whole city of Atlanta that had yeah, that's that. Great. <laughs> uh you know, and you know, that's what, you know, Spetzel said it's class evidence. And then if you look at what the fibers that were found with Amy, like you mentioned they were uh, what was the exact trilobal polyester fibers, nutmeg in color? <laughs> but it's a, but it was a more common. It, it was a more common. It was more common than like they than used it fifty. In, yeah, um, yeah. Like then, I mean, just saying. Like they I think made, it was in all the Pontiac, that type of Pontiac, that type of colored Pontiac from that year. I think it was in most of them. Okay, and but so was it just in one vehicle though? It wasn't like in any other. Well, we're talking one one type of vehicle. Okay, that's what I mean. Like, yeah, so, you know, however many, is that like 50,000? Is that right. 20,000? But how many of those are in, you know, it lets you narrow it down. How many of those are in Northeast Ohio? How many How many of the suspects have cars like that? Well, my top suspect does. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, is that just <clears throat> the worst coincidence ever? Right. You know, I mean, eventually you have to start thinking... Either this guy did it or he's the most unluckiest son of a gun that, you know, ever lived because everything you look at seems to connect him circumstantially to this crime. You you watch, you know, any crime shows or any any specials on, you know, that that type of stuff. It it Yeah, there you there are too many coincidences and the circumstances line up perfectly and it it just kind of goes to show you that like you need so much to convict yeah you know it, before anybody makes that final move it's like if this is the guy what the hell are they waiting for and you know it, if they know it's him then you know why haven't they done anything let's roll about the it? dice well it might a- end up working out in the end uh you know it might be a good thing that they haven't because um i do believe this case i feel i i think this case is going to be solved within the next 12 months uh, because of this new familial uh if i'm saying it right uh dna um stuff that they have where you you know the we spetzel and and you know has has alluded to the fact that they have some sort of DNA evidence, maybe not a full strand of DNA, but they have enough to work with. And now we have the ability to look for certain markers from that DNA profile. And then up, I, I had the opportunity to talk to one of the FBI profilers that worked on the profile for Amy's killer with, uh, I think maybe Douglas himself worked on it a little bit. But, um, and that's the, the profiler is the one who told me, you know, because I told him, you know, look, I, I've got this great suspect, but we know he was into little boys. Um, and that's kind of turning some of the police off. And, and the profiler is the one that told me, he's like, those guys don't make any sort of differentiation if they're, you know, if these kids are prepubescent. So if you're looking at people that are into to little boys, they're into little girls too. So um, hopefully that's changed some minds, uh, you know, in, in regards to this top suspect. But so you asked me before about has anything changed since I started investigating this? Yeah. So I told you about that suspect. No, I, I'm not even call him a suspect because it's just what does circum- that mean? And, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I don't want to throw that. You know, I'm not putting his name out there or anything like that. But the circum- one that called you at home? No, nah, that guy. We're gonna, okay. we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna leave him. I've got my own suspicions on who <laughs> I think that guy is, and you know that's fine. He can. He can know that. <laughs> but the guy that I came across was the guy that had been hired by the city of Rocky River mm. on October 26th. Oh, right. And then fired on the 28th. Yeah. And then he also had something expunged where he had 
been caught doing something in the metro parks. Oh, you know, interesting. Which is right by the nature center. Yeah. Where he lived a quarter mile from, or about a half mile from, but he lived actually only a quarter mile from Amy's parents' house. Oh, wow. So he went on as far as profiles, since since we're talking about profilers, you know, when they say, okay, generally speaking, this guy would have um, gone, you know, gone into drugs or gotten into alcohol or used something to to mask the the guilt. The guilt. Yeah. Well, this particular individual had three DUIs in the 90s. Wow. Um, and if there's anything that says, you know, drinking problem, it's three DUIs. Yeah. And you found this guy just by going through, like, city records and I, who was working that day? Yeah. I, I had a... F- I did work when I was in college for the city of Rocky River, and I just remember being able to basically do whatever you wanted during the day just drive around as far as like if yeah you, know, you 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 had kind of free will to just drive around so i just had this suspicion that maybe this person you know this was before any like this was actually before you had even named your top suspect but thinking about thinking about it at the time i was just like well this person could have won you know, that's just how I got the records, basically. That was, you know, he could have been driving around. But what gets you fired in one day? Yeah, right. You don't yeah. go to work. Right, right. So it's like, okay, you got fired. Guess what he was doing? It's because he was either maybe he went yeah. to work and he left because he had set up this this yeah. rendezvous with Amy. And then, you know, he would have been like, that's why... I've asked you before, like with with the perception of two ten year olds, you know, you see a twenty one year old and you think, oh my god, that that right. guy could be thirty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they do say now that the they think the age range is twenty five to thirty five. Mm. So I mean, what's twenty one? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Have you talked to the police or FBI about this? I've brought it up, and you know, <laughs> you know, like Spetzel would say, he's like, there's so many names, I can't. Yeah, you know, I can't even, you know, I. I I don't even know. What's this guy doing now? He lives, um, as far as professionally, I'm not sure. I know he's got a family, lives, I think, somewhere on the west side. Hmm. Um, You know, I don't want to, you know, throw him under the bus if he's got nothing to do with it. But, you know, there were just a lot of weird similarities. And the fact that he had something that occurred in the Mm -hmm. Metro Parks in the months prior that he had expunged. Yeah. You know, like... There's and I and I don't know what to make of it because you know the, you can see that there was a charge but there's nothing there. Hmm. There's no yeah yeah. I know usually there's like yeah. a citation number or like a crime number or right. you know something that relates to what he did. Where did you find that? Like on the Rocky River Court website or yeah. something? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly where I found that. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, so that was just it was just you know you you look for red flags and so. Mm-hmm. You know, thanks to FOIA, um, I was able to get that information. And that was just something that stood out to me because I'm like, hired on the 26th, fired on the 28th. What the fuck gets you fired that quickly? Yeah, really. Uh, there's there's only one thing. Yeah. <laughs> and it's... <laughs> or, or or showing up drunk or well, something like that. Right. But yeah, but yeah, not showing up, that'll do it. Yeah. So, I mean, it just... It, it kind of goes along with what you said. There's so many people with mm-hmm. the means and the motive opportunity... And it's like you can have your top suspects, you can have your top 10, your top 20, whatever. But it's like, God, there's so many people that it could be. But circumstantially, you look at and it's like, yeah, the top guy definitely feels like he could be the guy. Yeah. Um, But till that day comes where the, the match comes in or we, you know, we have him in cuffs, it's... Well, I, it's, it's a matter of time at this point. And I'd say months not not years at this point like months away from from getting this guy maybe maybe sooner maybe weeks i'd like to think wouldn't it be nice to have that happen on the anniversary this year that would be um apropos and uh god that would be amazing i appreciate you coming in james <laughs> thanks again yeah, for um you know i've always appreciate your insight and uh 
just wanted to uh, touch base, you know, halfway through this series and just see, uh, you know, basically pick your brain again and just uh, thank you. Yeah, you know. congratulations on the success of the podcast. It's, thank, it's thank a you. lot of attention. Yeah, it's it's so far so good, and um, you've been a big part of it. And I just wanted to. Uh, uh, say thank you and uh, appreciate all your insights. No, I think it feels like this is getting us a step or, or many steps closer to the finale, you know? Yeah, like one, I don't know if it feels like one final push, but yeah, um, I definitely feel like, you know, the, Spetzel and Torsen even said publicity. Yeah. You know, that's what we're going for. Good. So thanks again. Yeah, good luck. Many thanks to James Renner for making the trip up to the studio for another round of conversation regarding the Amy Mihaljevic case. I hope that our conversation was able to provide the listeners with some answers to the questions that they have had through the first four episodes. I will uh, return next week for episode six of Who Killed Amy Mihaljevic? Thank you for listening, and be safe. If you are interested in supporting independent journalism such as this podcast, you can click on the donate button on the bottom left on whokilledamymihalovic.com. If you could leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts, that will also help support the show and help get Amy's story the coverage it deserves. You can contact the Bay Village Police Department at 440-871-1234 if you have any new information regarding this case. The FBI is offering a reward of up to $25,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the individual or individuals responsible for the death of Amy Renee Mihaljevic. Anyone with information concerning this case, please contact the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI. You may also contact your local FBI office or the nearest American embassy or consulate. Thank you again for listening to this week's episode of Who Killed Amy Mihaljevic. <laughs>